and to great racing history. But so keep in mind, every time you run a Lion Eye Racing Series event, whether you're the feature winner or finish 10th in the feature, you're adding to the heritage of Chicagoland area midget auto racing. Banquet time here. Where's all those notes you gave me, LaBert? <laughs> Some special guests with us tonight. Stand up when you mention your name. Four-time UARA midget champion. He was a 1964 UARA Rookie of the Year. Bob Richards sitting out there. Bob Wolfe. 68 UARA champion. Came from the Illinois area, moved to Phoenix, Arizona for many, many years and is now back in the Illinois area here. I don't know why he came back to Illinois for the winter time. But whatever. 1968 UARA champion, Wally Lambert. Five time sportsman midget champion. She was pretty tough to beat from 1992 through 2003. She won 27 feature races during her championship years. Sue Spencer, Sue Spencer with us. I was talking to this fellow earlier and I said, I remember you racing mini stocks at Raceway Park back in 1970. He said, yeah, I had a phony driver's license so I could sneak in underage. He was a 1979 Joliet Memorial Stadium midget champion, longtime UARA competitor and U Brown competitor, Tom Corcoran. Another longtime area racer, Gracie Bruce. He was a 1970 UARA rookie, raced USAC Midget Silver Crown cars, and of course, one of his biggest victories was at USAC Silver Crown victory at IRP back in 1988. And in the latest issue of Sprint Car and Midget Magazine, there's a story on Bruce. Uh, done by Steve Sinclair. And he has copies, I think, for sale for what, 1995, including the autograph, Bruce Field. Bruce Field was done. <laughs> the wife of the legendary midget racer Bob Tattersall from Streeter, Illinois. Bob Tattersall, a two time UARA champion, USAC national champion in 1969. A racing hero in New Zealand and Australia where he almost every winter went out to race out there in the speed car events as they called them. D. Tattersall with us this evening. D. Tattersall. Thank you for coming. A longtime photographer in these parts, a big supporter of the midget racing in Grundy County Speedway on Saturday nights until he had an unfortunate accident there one evening. Phil Ryder here today. Phil Ryder, longtime racing photographer. Our evening special guest, special guest speaker, a member of the famous Bettenhausen family, the first family of racing here in Illinois, son of the great Tony Bettenhausen, Timmy Park Express, they used to call him. Merle Bettenhausen, him and his late brothers Gary and Tony followed their dad's footsteps in the automobile racing. And that Bettenhausen name to this day is just part of our racing heritage and history. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight Mr. Merle Bettenhausen. Thank you, Stan. Uh, you know, I'm honored to, to be part of that family. Uh, my dad and my brother set the standards that uh, I had to try to live up, with, live up to, and it was rather difficult. You know, everybody talks about why Gary and I and, and my brother Tony start racing, but it's really interesting. I'm going to give you the story of the start of the Benton House and racing. My dad was born on September 12, 1916. He was the youngest of eight children. Born in the family farm in Timley Park, Illinois. His dad had built this gigantic farmhouse back in 1878. And my dad was the youngest of eight children. When my dad was 18 months old, his dad was out picking corn for the horse and wagon. And the horse reared up and kicked my grandfather in the stomach. 
hand about 10 days later, he died of a ruptured appendix. My dad was 18 months old. He never knew his father. He never had that bond that a father and a son have as they grow up. In fact, every time he walked out in the barn and saw a horse, he kind of upset him. In his mind, he didn't want to grow up to be a farmer. There was something more important in life that he could do. And he was the baby of the family, and he was spoiled, and, and he was uh, a mischievous, that's my word, child as he grew up, got in fights. Uh, and uh, supposedly he went through 16 cars from the age of 16 to 21. He wrecked them and crashed them and kept digging in the, uh, the vault of the family Benton house uh, as, as he went on. But he heard about, as you said, Stan River, Riverview Park, you know, in Chicago. And so he went down there, had his brother, his older brother take him down there. And he watched these little race cars racing around in a circle, and throwing up dust. And he thought, man, this, this is better than walking behind a horse and helping feel somewhere. So, with a big bar of steel, he would go down and watch his race at the Riverview Park. When he was 18 years old, he borrowed some money from his mother and bought his first race car. He couldn't race back then when he was 30 or 21. So he had a couple guys drive for him, and uh, he decided that when he turned 21 that they weren't doing what he wanted to do. So he fired him, he bought a helmet, and that's what started his racing. So he raced midgets from the time he was 21 up until he got older and uh, took my mom to the speedway the first time in 1939 and they were sitting down the first turn and my dad told my mother, he says, I'm going to race here and I'm going to win here. So at that time he was 23 years old. He had a dream. He had a real dream that he wanted to do. He wanted to race again. So he started racing. Started very successful after getting upside down a few times. In fact, he was upside down a total of 21 times in his life. And uh, he lived through all those. Of course, he did it in 1961. But uh, he was just getting going in 1941. He, he won his first champ car race, as they called it back then. And then World War II broke out. When World War II broke out, he, was, he ended up working at the Ford plant in Chicago. And they were building the, the airplane engine the B-52. It was a very difficult time for my dad because he had just got a taste of victory and knew what it was like to, to be a racing champion. And so he kind of suffered through World War II, but when the, world, when the war was over, uh, he got hooked up and he ran the first Indy 500 in 1946. And just to give you a little brief thing, my dad raced at Indy 13 times. He finished the race three times without mechanical problems. He ran second, fourth, and fourth. But ten times there was something that went wrong with the race car and he didn't finish. So he doesn't have a big racing history at the Indy 500, and it was mostly because he was kind of jinxed there. So anyway, he started racing in 46, became the AAA racing champion in 1991. He won eight out of 13 races, and he was the champion. And then in 1958, he won the USAC championship again, the IndyCar championship, and he never won a race. So he was the first one ever to, he, at that particular point in time, he had more victories, eight, winning the championship, and he won the championship with no victory. So he was quite a guy, and I was telling people, my dad died in 1961, he was 44 years old. The, uh, the prime part of the summer during racing is we would go to Milwaukee, and we race stock cars on Thursday, midgets on Saturday, and champ cars on Sunday. And then the following weekend was, was Labor Day at the point, and they'd race midgets on Saturday, stock cars on Sunday, and champ cars on Monday. Well, this is my dad just six months before he was killed. He ran, he won the midget he won the stock car race at Milwaukee on Thursday, he won the midget race on Saturday, he was leading the champ car race, and we were in one of them. 17 laps to go. So then we went to the coin and he finished second in the major race, second in the stock car race, second in the champ car race, and that was the first champ race that AJ Foy won. So there he is over the hill at age 43, 
44, and, uh, and he's racing like he's never raced before. And as we all know, uh, in 1961, a very dear friend of his was Paul Russo. And Paul Russo, uh, fellow competitor, known him for 30 years. We were working on the farm. Uh, we were farming 500 acres at that time. My dad said, I'm going, to, I'm going to put them on the farm and on the tractor so they don't go out and race on the street. So he, he was trying to keep us out of trouble. But uh, Paul Russell was a dear friend. He spent three months with us while we were putting this grain dryer in on the farm. And then when May rolled around, my dad uh, was asked if he'd take Paul Russell's car for a ride. And uh, he drove the car and made three laps. Doug Sterling owned the race car. He did not have a mechanical at that time. And uh, he forgot to put a powder pee, powder pee in a hassle nut on the right front uh, radius rod, and it fell out coming down the front straightaway. My dad put the brakes on the car again, right? He didn't fall on the foot and was uh, killed at that time when he was 44 years old. I was 17, Gary was 19. I was just getting ready to graduate from high school. And uh, even though you lose your father after all this time, everywhere we looked in our lives, anything that had value came from the race club. So even though we lost our dad, it was Gary's idea, my idea, Tony, the by the Tony from the nine at the time, he wanted to race too. So Gary started racing first. Gary raced go parts, and then built his own stock car in 1963. And I was still on the farm, farming the farm with my family. My sister was, I have a sister that's a couple years younger than me. She lives in Phoenix now. And uh, she was going to college. But I didn't want to, I didn't want to be a farmer the rest of my life. Of course, anybody that remembers back there at the time, uh, if you weren't married, if you weren't going to school, you got drafted. So in 1965, I got drafted in the Army while Gary was still racing. Spent two years in the Army. How many veterans are there? Stand, stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Take a little, little sidebar here. Uh, I retired in 2010 and uh, became a volunteer at the VA Hospital in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I've been to the VA every Monday for the last seven years when I was in town. And I'm a volunteer. I do visitation. And and I also work with veterans with PTSD, and so it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And the older I get, the more proud I am that I spent two years in the Army. And I didn't have combat, didn't go to Vietnam, but I was a personnel specialist. I made rank E5 in the two years I was in the Army. And so it's, uh, the older I get, the more proud I am. And thank you all your veterans. But, in fact, I was in the Army, Gary's racing and racing and having some success. And Gary's first year at Indianapolis in 1968. And uh, that was just about the time that uh, I got out of the Army in 67 and raced midgets. And uh, won my first feature in 1968 at IRP. And of course, we all know Gary. He, Gary raced at the Roger Penske in 1972 and led the Indy 500 with 138 laps fell off the race with 18, 18 laps to go. And a little sidebar here, Gary was with Chuck, Bible uh, Propensity teammate with Mark Dunning. We all know that Mark Dunning was in that race then. But there was something that most people don't know, is that while Gary was leading the race, Mark Dunning was running second. And Gary could see Mark Dunning in front of him. He fell off the race and getting ready to lap that time. And of course, Gary fell out of the race and only made it with Mark Don. He went out of the Mike Pesky's first race in 1970. Gary was so much faster that it was a pleasant time. But we all know Gary went on to win two USAC uh, print car championships, won two Silver Crown championships. And the thing that most people don't know those, those Silver Crown championships where one was, was driving, he had two arms, but he, but he won the driving, just one. And he got hurt in Syracuse in 1974. 
he lost the ability to use his left arm. He had his left arm. He couldn't, he couldn't bend it. And he could put it on his steering wheel with about 95% of all his body in the right arm. So he went on and uh, raced in Indy 23 times and the best finish was the third, 1980. And uh, quite another, he passed away. March 17th, 2014, and uh, that's from every day. It's a little bit different. We had a very, very say, stern way of saying it's my way or no way. And his favorite song is Thanks and After Us. He did it my way. But very honored to have him as a brother. My kid brother, uh, he, he was nine when my dad died. My mom remarried. And, he was living in Houston, Texas. Gordon Van Loo, who sponsored Indy Cars for a number of years, he gave Tony a ride in his stock car. Tony came up racing in NASCAR. And never was real successful. So he was a wonderful, wonderful guy, great promoter, but it didn't have I guess he didn't go up with Tony Milton House again. My dad's influence was doing right and don't do it at all. And uh, I wish I could tell you. How many times I didn't do it and got yelled at for not doing it. But uh, he was quite a father. Tony raced, uh, had his own racing team, and uh, he was an avid flyer. He bought an airplane and flew it had like 1,800 hours in the 172. And then he bought a twin engine airplane and he's flying back. He had a plane for six months, he's flying it back from Homestead spring practice in 2001 and uh, iced up the plane crash when he lost his wife in this fireplace. And so that was very tragic and I was the, the guardian of his two teenage children. So I carried through that and got the racing team. Just uh, the kids are doing fine. One has a little girl, the other one was married, and uh, one lives in Indianapolis near me, and the other one lives in San Francisco, moving to Houston. So that is kind of an outlay of overrun of my brothers and my dad. Now, now I'll tell you about my school. I grew up as, initially I was Tony's second son, and I was, and I was very fun. I started racing in like 1967 when I got out of here. And uh, what wasn't near as successful as, as uh, Gary was, but I tried hard. I had the pleasure of going to Australia and New Zealand to meet Bob Tattersall. He was like my big brother. He taught me probably as much as Gary taught me in those racing years. Just a wonderful, wonderful man, great race driver. But I raced, and I raced midgets and sprint cars and a few silver pound races. And, and I was working my way. I won eight two-sack midget features. Not a big deal, but a lot of race one of years and didn't win anything. So I guess it's I had an opportunity to drive my first Indy car. I took my test at Indy in 1972 and spun in practice and hit the wall. We fixed the car back up. Went out and I was in line to make a qualifying. So my next race was in Michigan. So I went to Michigan, qualified 18. The race started, had never been in the race, never been in the traffic. The race started in the third lap, got a little high coming off the second corner. I hit the fence with the right front wheel, came back and the truck was filled. Back in the day, 35 gallons of fuel on the right side and 35 gallons of fuel on the left. It went through the right side tank. Fire. Simultaneously, my head went over to the side of the windshield, and we initially in our helmets, we gave the full face helmets, had a plastic button. We sheared that plastic button in my face. Well, I'm still going straight, I'm still going straight on the back. The fire came up my face. That's not a good place to be. So I didn't know where I was going, but I knew I didn't want to be where I was at. So I undid my seat belt. Outside the car, tried to push myself across the car and get back in front of the fence. The second time, I got my arm caught in the race, but the fence 
completely cut my arm off. So, the fire is some intense, I feel like back down there, and I'm trying to get out of the water. I'm trying to get out of the water. Sound like this, except it was about seven fire. And so finally, I turned them up and I saw them around and I thought, oh my God, help me, help me. So they had the firefighters there and they were trying to put the fire out. But the, it's a strange how things happen. With 35 gallons on the left side and 35 gallons on the right side, when the fire hit the wall, it tore the right side through the wall. And I'm sitting right next to the wall, but there's an inch to also to keep the tie the two tanks together. So it's like a garden hose and methanol coming out in the fire, feeding the fire, but they can't get to it because they can't get down the way the race car was. So it just, it was pretty bad. But the state plant was on hell. They came in and they grabbed me and they pulled me out of the car. And, uh, I went to the hospital the next day. I was spending two months in the when I was laying in the emergency room, Gary came up, well, kid, you still want to drive race cars? I went, oh, oh. So, it didn't take any spirit out of me. It just went on. Sometimes they're not that important. Just, you know. So, two months in the hospital, got out of the hospital, and the first thing on my mind was going back racing. There was a fellow from Pennsylvania, and in Hawaii, who lost his right arm, Tim Greenman. I secured before I did my thing. And so I called him and he told me what he did. We made a device. And it was, uh, I had one of my prosthesis and had an incoming prosthesis and went into the uniball and the steering wheel. And so whatever I did with the right, right arm and the left arm followed, it didn't really help me drive or steer. But it looked good for you, Seth. So, so I can do this. So 11 months later, I uh, drove my first race at Cross Creek in one hour. And, uh, I had a third quick time, second to go to one lead race, and then I had a huge uh, race. So that was enough to make me think that I could probably do this with one arm. So that was in June. 1970. I'm getting old, it's like, you know, the decades go by. <laughs> and uh, so we had a race in Johnson City, Tennessee, and qualified fifth, and won my team race. And we're the first time, so I started to pour it. Bill Lane Hart was in the front row, and if I know Bill Lane Hart, he's part of the deck. With silver hair like me, and very, very good race car. So it's a 40 lap feature, and we've been trying to develop power steering for the work about one or three times. We work early in the feature and power steering. So at that particular time, I'm going to be worried about the old flight. So I thought, well, if I just sit by my time, I can be worried that's the best one arm. So I sat there, restart, and the green came out, I got five guys. It was kind of unique. This was a, a third mile drift track for the head. It had like a short shoot. And I really had that kind of cat. So I thought, what am I going to do? And if I would have thought as hard, I had two arms, I did that night, I had one arm, if I would have done this, period. But I just, what am I going to do? I'm fast at this part of the track, but if I get down the other end of the track, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm the outside the building. So I waited and I decided I'm going to wait for the last lap, last point, take one attempt. If I win, I win. If I don't, I'm going to set So I followed Joe, followed the time, followed Joe. We got down, we got the white flag, one, two, three, four. four. And the first I got a run, I got a long side of the and I got He saw me, he, had, he knew I was there, but he didn't think I was as fast as I was. When he, I, I, I knew I had to beat because when he saw me, I heard, I heard his engine go ring, and, uh, and I hit my team by about six inches. 
guys, you know, things happen in life. Some things are bad, some things are good. Some things teach us teach lessons. And I can only tell you that winning that race in front of calling somebody early, I think that's the end of my life. That's 20, 29, just turned 30 years old. And other than being a farmer, racing was all I knew. And that particular night, it involved in the story about I could beat you with one arm tied behind my back. You can't be done. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that particular night uh, has lasted me my whole life. If I could do that, I could do anything. And so I had realized that I couldn't buy any cars again. So my mind was when the 73 season ended. I was Monday, 1974, try to become the one and only one arm USAC media champion. And didn't win any races in the early part of 1974, but I had some seconds and I had some thirds. And ever since I won that race, and I, there was, I was a different person, that felt different, that believed different, that there's so much more inside of us that if we use our mind and our heart and our soul, we can find it. Find something in we didn't know what that was. So, the 74 season starts off, and, and we're going to July 4th weekend. Gary goes to Syracuse, New York, and that's when Gary got hurt really bad. He's got a, got a silver gun bar upside down, and uh, paralyzed his left arm. And, then, and I go out to see him in Syracuse, and I thought, you know what? As good as Gary was, if something like this could happen to him, and so I decided to win in the end of the year. I'm 31 years old. I call retirement, and I just, you know, I just decided I was going to race it. But as far as that winning that championship goes, uh, it's July, July 4th, about halfway through the season, I was 47 points behind Mel Penn, and I was second. So I, I do believe, you know, if and but you can be nuts for Christmas every year or every day, but I believe that had that uh, Gary Knight got hurt, I'd run the whole season. The one arm few set video champion. And I would probably bet you all the money in the world that nobody ever would want to match that with me. <laughs> so, but it, it's in life it's, it's funny what how things happen and what you do and Bobby and I have been talking about what you are very great. You meet me, I have a very two saying. I'm the luckiest man alive. How's your day, Rob? It's great to get And when I think of how I was in 1972, laying in the hospital, they told me that probably another 25 seconds, my eyes would have dissolved in the fire. In another two minutes, I would have lost enough blood that I thought it would die. So every day I think of where I was in life and where I am today. And I am the lucky fool. And I have good health, I exercise, I eat my food. And so it's, a, it's what we find inside of us that makes up your I had went on to become an advertising manager for the biggest car dealership in Indianapolis. That's why they hired me in 2010 for 15 years. And uh, it, was, it was not in work for this man. But I just, uh, I can't believe who I am and what I am and how God has taken care of me and guided me. And he gives a big thank you for me every night. I would have had it. And I just uh, I hope everybody don't know how good you are, guys, until you're tested. You got to go through a test to see how we come back. I remember I came to the hospital one day and he said, "Well, it's not what happens in your life; it's what you do." About it. So I, uh, I believe I've done the right thing. I have two beautiful children, seven grandchildren. I had a beautiful wife for 20 years. She decides she likes somebody else more, so I've been, I've been divorced, and uh, they call me one and done. 
Thank you. 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 You know, you look at me and you see with one arm and you think, and everybody goes, oh my God, so is that. Well, I just all want you to know that you think life is a lot tougher with one arm than I do. It's not a big deal. In fact, you know what it does? It makes you think. Because everything I do is a crime. I've got to figure out how to do it. So, psychologists have said over the years, that an average person will use 8 to 10% of his brain capability in a lifetime. Because why? You do things by habit, without thought. And with my situation, there, there's no habit, because everything is a, is a stop, and how am I going to do this, and how am I going to do that? So by this happening, maybe I use 11 to 12% of my brain capability. So, sorry, but I'm probably a little bit smarter than <laughs> But, but it's, 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 it's all what's in your head. And it's how you think, how you do it. And uh, life is so wonderful. And I always found out that it's not what you don't have in life. It's what you do have. Now, before I open some questions, uh, I've already had a story you want to tell. I say this is a story. So, you know, true. Anyway, so I, I, I had an interview where I, I heard that they needed an airport uh, parking lot manager in and out of the International Airport. <laughs> so, so uh, I had already basically confirmed this job as an advertising manager for Ray Stillman, but I said, well, I'll go out. It's a good experience. So, so I, I went out had my resume with me and everything, and, and I'm walking through the airport, and I found out where this guy's man, his office was. And so uh, I walked in, and the guy goes, you're hired. I said, what, what, what? You're going to manage my parking lot. And they said, you haven't seen your resume? You haven't asked me a question? Uh, why me? He said, nobody's going to do that. And they didn't ask me a question. I said, well, what, what is the job? He said, well, you're going to stand at the entrance to the park. The cars come around the corner, and when they get right to you, you go, short-term parking. <laughs> 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 That's my favorite story. <laughs> <laughs> after all these serious business, it's nice to have a nice, nice plan. So, do we have any questions? Anything anything on the table that... Uh, Yes. What did you say today was uh, Gary's birthday? Today is Gary. Gary would be uh, 76 years old today. His birthday is November 18th. In fact, uh, when Laverne and we talked about it, I said, you know, let's do it on Gary's birthday. We can, it could be a banquet. So, so you've you got double purposes. Any questions? Let's have some questions. Yes, sir. Any questions? Let's have some questions. That's better than that. But uh, guys, thank you so much. It's my pleasure, and uh, I hope you know, know a little bit more about the Benton Houses right now. And uh, uh, thank you for having me, Laverne. Thank you.